I'm Boris from Lernable and SignPoint, and I have a question to Chris Epstein. Uh, you mentioned for when you are implementing new features, can you hear me? Closer, closer. Okay, so for Chris, Boris from Learnable and SidePoint. You mentioned that when considering new features, you are looking at uh, straightforward de debugging and knowing how it works for developer easy way and uh, being intuitive. But what about if there's a feature that's violating these principles in the current release? I actually came across that case just last week, and it's the aliasing of, of variable names with dashes and underscores. So what happened was that in discourse, there was a guy who was refactoring the variables, and he had a link dash color variable at the top of the file, and then as part of his refactoring, he decided to change the variables, and the work in progress have them underscored, so we had link underscore color somewhere else. And I used it somewhere else in the files, and then I wasn't getting the right color for a long time, and then just by sheer chance, I came across the other variable with underscore that was overriding the dashed one, so All right. what yeah. about hiding it under a feature flipper so or configuration? Let, let me explain. Uh, the the so to summarize basically you had some you had two variables the that were the exact same characters but they varied in terms of whether they used underscores or dashes uh, so there is a feature in SAS where you can use underscores or dashes they are basically interchangeable in a variable name <clears throat> and the reason for that is an aesthetic choice because. Some developers really like underscores, and some developers really like dashes. And the person who writes your framework might have liked a different kind of variable aesthetic choice than you did. And we want you to have uh, a very pleasant aesthetic experience in the file that you're looking at, the one that is the choice of, uh, that you get to, in the code that you author, you get, you get to make that aesthetic choice. And so we made a decision to allow basically dashes and underscores to be interchangeable so that you had a beautiful style sheet. Uh, the downside of that is you might not expect that feature. Uh, <laughs> everything is a trade-off. Um, sorry. Got a question for the whole panel. What is your favorite feature that's coming in the next version of CSS that we should look out for? The matches pseudo selector. Shoot, I don't know. Um, uh, it'll be cool to be able to use variables. Say that. Uh, yeah, probably dynamic variables. I can go with uh, everyone else on that one, variables. <laughs> Um, since everybody until now has said the variables, I'm pretty excited about a few things. Uh, conic gradients among them, that would be... What gradients? Conic, conic gradients. gradients. Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like uh, Anna said, I'm also really excited about conic gradients, although it doesn't seem they'll make it in browsers anytime soon because they're not uh, implemented by the graphics libraries that they use. I actually suggested Quantic Gradient several years ago and wrote the first draft of the spec that, that's now in Image Values 4. Uh, I'm also really excited about corner shape, which will enable us to do like cut out corners and inner border radius stuff. And like corner shape bevel will allow us to make triangles and, and octagons and hexagons and all sorts, trapezoids, all sorts of shapes that are really difficult today. And of course also variables and nesting. And yeah, that's about it. <laughs> so you're excited about all of the things, basically. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I guess because I come at things from a more uh, like architectural perspective, I am excited about variables, but I really wish we would have uh, something more like extends. Uh, in CSS natively, so sorry, I'm kind of answering the questioning, kind of not. Hi, uh, I'm most excited about shape, um, 
because it kind of breaks us out of that idea that the, the web is always this box. And um, yeah, it's just something that will, will kind of change things up a little bit. Um, maybe variables too, but to not repeat always, uh, maybe just more creative features like filters and blend modes and yeah, like shapes and kind of regions where we can cut out text and yeah, those things. Uh, I noticed a uh, few people did say get better tab uh, earlier and that was really awesome. So thanks guys. Question on front here. Hi, my name's David. Um, I've just got a question around, uh, this was touched on by Chris about CSS testing. <laughs> Griffith. Uh, and I'm just interested in around solutions around uh, testing layouts. Um, maybe Nicholas and Connor might have some opinions on this. So incorporating that into your CI testing or um, your test suites or in your Git PRs. Uh, have anybody, has anybody had solutions around how to test layout um, uh, bugs that might come in from CSS changes um, and solutions around that? Yeah, so there's a few ways you can do that now. Um, most of them kind of revolve around like a headless browser like Phantom. Um, there's a kind of brute force ways that you can render a page and then take an image of both of them in a particular state and then do like an image comparison. And you can plug that into your CI and you can say, well, if the image is different between like the last commit and this commit, then, you know, we consider the layout broken. Um, and then there's things like Casper.js, um, which let you run kind of more extensive tests and you can do like computed uh, style comparisons there. Um, or you can use um, BAS with Phantom.js that'll work too. So you can write a CSS assertion that says, okay, well, I expect the height of this to be 10 pixels or whatever and it'll run against the computed style there. So there's a few different ways you can do it. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Um, yeah, I think the visual diffing, which is uh, what Chris was hinting at, uh, or described. Like, so that's the screenshot comparison stuff. That's how um, I think most companies with large applications are, are going. Uh, so Facebook do it. In fact, the Instagram team wrote a tool called Huxley um, that kind of fills in part of that tool chain. Uh, the BBC wrote something called Wraith. Uh, there's Phantom CSS as well, which also gives you an API for taking screenshots and clicking around so you can kind of do user flows and take screenshots along the way. Um, and Google wrote one, um, which is slightly different in character to the others, uh, called Depicted, which is um, like, yeah, I think more of an end-to-end -end thing where you kind of render your entire, uh, render entire pages and take screenshots and it gives you information about where the differences are. And that's really good for uh, being able to test things that you're not even necessarily sure you need to check for regressions on. Um, so rather than knowing ahead of time that you want to check like the size of a button, you kind of just get feedback as soon as you inadvertently break something. So I think that's a pretty that's pretty useful. But yeah, I haven't got a huge amount of experience working with it. Hi, uh, Nicholas. Um, your ideas around components. Do you think that's a precursor to the web component component standard, or do you think it's more complementary? Did you say more complementary? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess in some level it's um, like a precursor to it, that there'll be aspects of uh, existing component-based approaches that you'll be able to roll into web components. But I also think that by the time we get web components uh, in a state that's something you can use in production, that a lot of library code authors will have already like, got different approaches. Like if you look at how React works, like under the hood, it's, uh, it's doing something different to uh, what web components um, is planning to do, at least the last time I looked. So web components is based around um, using uh, mutation observers. So you kind of can look at an object and when it changes, then you get, like, you get informed about that change and then you can update your view. Um, whereas React uh, doesn't really do that. It's kind of more like um, how video games work, where they kind of um, don't have to know about the existing state of things. They just basically re-render every single time. Like, um, so the implementation is really efficient that React uses, but it's effectively just drawing new frames every time. So, yeah, I don't know if that's something that will eventually make it into browsers, but um, I quite like thinking like that. It's, it feels quite simple.
it was, it was magazines good. for everyone. There's no silly questions. Hey, so my question is about when browser features intersect with like preprocessors, so in the case of variables and other things coming in the future, is there a reason that browser vendors go down the way of, or the spec authors go down the way of not implementing things that have been done in preprocessors? So a naive example would be variables. Is there a reason to use a different syntax when people are already accustomed to? Is it there a semantic difference that I don't want to confuse people by? Or is there a reason to not use what's relatively popular usage already and to go on a different track? And is there like a way for maybe spec authors and preprocess authors to kind of work closer together? And your thoughts on that? <laughs> Leah, do you, do you want to take this or should I take a crack at it? So, uh, for example, for variables, the reason the syntax is different is because CSS variables are not exactly variables right now, they're custom properties, so they're actually more flexible than variables in preprocessors. For other modules, uh, the reasons might be, uh, are, are sometimes different. For example, nesting has a different syntax because CSS has different needs from preprocessors. Preprocessors only need, run once, so their performance needs are very different. So, uh, with nesting, for example, if we implemented nesting in the same way that preprocessors do, there were parsing problems basically to figure out if something was a declaration or an entire new CSS rule. You, you, uh, you needed to have infinite look ahead, which is a pretty bad thing for performance when you're writing a parser, uh, which is why uh, they need to start with a specific token that's the same every time. It was an ampersand, but I think the syntax has changed now. Um, whereas in preprocessors, the ampersand is optional because they only run once, so infinite look ahead is not that big of a problem. So the reason the syntax is different between preprocessors and CSS is different depending on the case. Sometimes it's a, it's a different implementation of things, other times it's just different needs. It really depends on the case. But we are monitoring preprocessors and trying to implement these things in CSS whenever it's possible. Does that answer the question? Thanks. Uh, a magazine, maybe? <laughs> we should really start giving those away. He's got one. Oh, okay. Uh, this is for Leah. Um, you, earlier on in your, your talk, you started talking about some subpixel anti-aliasing, and later on, you started using examples with. Um, alpha blending in text. Now, as far as I know, you can't use some subpixel anti-aliasing and alpha blending. Am I wrong in that? You, can't, you said you can't use subpixel anti-aliasing and alpha blending together? Yeah, when it comes to text. Yeah, uh, Chrome disables some subpixel anti-aliasing when you have opacity less than one, and in several other cases. So I guess, I mean, it makes sense if you think about it. How would you implement it? It's, it's not exactly easy. Yeah, but is it technically impossible or is it just a very, very hard problem? Uh, I honestly don't know if it's technically impossible, but it's pretty obvious that it's more difficult. And since browsers disable it when you, have, when you need alpha blending, maybe, I, I really don't know. Might just be really slow, right? It might be too much cal. It might be too much calculation to do on the fly for text. It might make the rendering of the text uh, too slow, or the scrolling of the page too slow when that kind of text is on there. I think browser vendors are constantly having to make trade-offs um, between rendering things as exactly as they'd like to and rendering them so that they're going to scroll fast enough and animate fast enough. And um, perhaps, and I don't know for sure, this is a case where they've made a trade-off and turned it off in order to make it more performant. That's entirely possible. Grayscale anti-aliasing is much uh, less computationally expensive, so it could be, that could be the reason. But we're just speculating here. Uh, 
Uh, hey, my name is Luke. Um, I'm just wondering, with all the changes around components and dependencies and the way we're dealing with a lot of stuff now more uh, programmatically in CSS, like, and in terms of CSS architectures, if any of the you guys have come across when you've had a, have big changes in your architecture, how you've handled it and like how you sort of let everyone in the team know what's sort of happening and how you handle like say even just basic things like switching to using something like Bower or Component or changing from say using the sort of separate CSS and JavaScript folders to using actual components. Um, just more like because I know that keeps changing as well. It's going to it feels like it's going to keep changing with web components. And what sort of your strategies are around that? Um, so I work on a pretty big team, and uh, our CSS is going to be very soon shared across multiple teams, um, building different products. But they're all meant to look like they go together. And so the idea is we're going to share components across them. Um, the thing that we've found that's been really effective is something we're calling style guide driven development which is that you build out your um, components and your pieces into the style guide first, get them generally validated, make sure they're all cleaned up, get a design pass to make sure all the animations are right and the timings are correct. And um, only once they're, uh, they're validated as, as functioning the way you want them to, then actually using them in a, in a section of the app or in a section of the uh, you know, page or something like that. And that's been particularly effective at keeping us all on the same page and making sure, like, we've got a bunch of tables where you can add stuff to the table and you can delete stuff from the table and you can sort the table. And so it's our uh, kitchen sink table, addable, deletable, sortable. And um, we've got them all sort of all over the site and we wanted to make sure that they stayed in sync with each other. And so having that live in the style guide first has sort of helped with that. Um, but I would say it's an ongoing process, at least for us. I don't know how you guys have found it, but... Um, it's something that requires kind of vigilance as well. Um, maybe there are some other ways, but so far it just seems like developers have to care. Anyone else want to? Style guides are great. <laughs> <laughs> Do style guides. Yeah. I can sit down with yeah. you. Yeah. 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 Hi, um, I'm Marty. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm actually interested to find out what's uh, the weirdest or most frustrating issue you've had with CSS? Um, there's something I want to do and uh, it's not really easy or you know, even possible. So if you have a list and you take an item out by either like display none or so, the gap should animate, right? And to make that like really fast and good performance, then it's kind of impossible, right? I mean, we can animate the height, but it's just not fast. And somehow, I hope maybe that we can add a transition to how page flows, but I don't know if that's kind of ever possible. But basically, just add, remove stuff, and have performant kind of transitions. That kind of uh, my wish for some some time here. So a really weird issue with CSS animations is that, for example, uh, I can't th I, I can't remember the case where I stumbled on it, but. A, a really characteristic example is if you have a CSS animation of a border that goes from zero solid black to 100 pixels solid black, and it's like a keyframe animation. So you apply the animation and you don't see anything, and you're stuck wondering why on earth is no animation happening here? And then you realize that border is essentially border width, border style, and border color, and it's like it, it, it's exactly the same as if you were animating all three separately, and because border border style is not animatable, it gets completely dropped from the keyframes, so it's, it, it's as if it doesn't exist. And since it doesn't exist, you get the default border style, which is none. So you don't see any border. And we actually resolved to change this behavior in a CSS working group meeting in 2012, in late 2012, and browsers still haven't changed their implementations, so you can still if you try out the, this sort of animation, you'll still see the issue today. 
Um, my pet hate in CSS is something that's unfortunately unavoidable, which is that there are a whole class of different problems that create circular dependencies. So one that I hit recently was, have you heard of the VH and VW units? They are the best thing in the world. Um, so it's uh, zero to 100 relative to the viewport. So like uh, uh, viewport width and viewport height um, makes it really, really easy for creating responsive UIs and things like that. The problem is that um, the different browsers incorporate the, they don't count the scroll bar width as part of the VH and VW uh, units. And the reason for that is if they did and the scroll bar disappeared or it came back, there would be a circular dependency, which means it would like not be able to resolve whether it was supposed to be um, you know, slightly larger or slightly smaller. And, and I can't remember the exact implementation details, but that kind of thing is really annoying because it gets in the way of what could potentially be a good feature. Um, and then like say in Firefox, which renders, at least on the Mac, the scroll bar is a opaque object, there's a whole bunch of stuff sliding underneath it if you use 100VW. Um, so that's really annoying and also a quirk of the way that CSS uh, styles are resolved. Um, one time I was animating an entire list. It was essentially a menu navigation. I was animating it in. And I was animating it in by a point, I think 0.85M amount translate. And what I found is in that particular translate, because I was doing 0.85 Ms, in some browsers it would, uh, when the translate happened, it would actually create gaps in between the objects as it was animating down. Because it was like uh, with Simurai's example, with uh, when he had 15 pixels for something, it was actually trying to calculate in between the gaps. And so I had kept having these see-through things, and I found that in, I think, I can't remember exactly what browsers it was, I think Firefox might have been one of them, but I don't want to pick on Firefox because I've had a go at Firefox a bit today. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it was pretty pretty dirty, and I ended up having to completely change my approach. I th I'm going to have to interrupt the, uh, it's like a th CSS therapy session now. <laughs> um, we're going to have two more quick questions, and then that's it. And I think I've already picked them, sorry. Um, hi, my question's to Anna specifically. Uh, and a little bit to Leah as well. When you're crafting the advanced CSS examples that you do, um, how do you do it? I, I tried <laughs> I tried making the torus that you've done in a previous example, and it completely fell apart. Um, yeah, I'd just love to know how you go through and actually create something that looks like that. Um, actually, I uh, start... Uh with a notebook and uh, a set of uh, colored pens. And um, the Taurus in uh, particular, uh, I saw an animated GIF and it wasn't exactly like my Taurus, but I got an idea and I started from there. And I thought I want to have um, something like, um, um, if you know what a hypocycloid is, cyclo <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Well, it's basically um, a sort of a roller that runs on a circle and draws these arcs that uh, touch the circle. So I thought, create something like that. Um, and the equations are pretty simple. And um, I just went from there. And the torus is basically you distribute on a pentagon you distribute uh, some segments, and then you distribute every ring with those segments, you distribute them around. But in general, every example, I, I just started, I draw it, and uh, some idea, some kind of flow chart of how I'm gonna do the calculations, and that's basically it. Uh, usually when I start making a talk, every time I want to present something, I try to think, how would, I, how would I understand this better if I didn't know this, if I was learning it for the first time? And how, like, how would it be better explained? It's a bit like, it's a bit like thinking about usability, uh, it, it, with the difference that the audience is the user and the slides are the UI. But the, the whole way of thinking is basically the same. 
And sometimes it changes over time. Like for example, in, when I first made the slides for this talk, the RGB cube in the beginning of my talk was just an image I found on Google Images. And then at, uh, one night I decided to change it and called a uh, CSS cube uh, with like SVG gradients for the different sides because you can't make that with CSS gradients. Uh, or the HWB system was like a slide with um, uh, so it was just a, a static slide and then I decided to implement the algorithm in JavaScript so I could show how the, the code would work. It's, 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 a, it's a process of evolution uh, over time. Uh, the, I, I, I think of an idea, oh hey, this would be better explained um, in a different way. For example, I, I don't like the way I'm explaining alpha blending in this talk, so I keep thinking, how would I explain it in a graphical way? Because People can't process that much code at once, so uh, I don't think it's very well explained by showing like eight lines of JavaScript or however long it is. So at some point I'm hoping I will figure out a way to show it graphically and then that slide will change as well. Hope that makes some sense. Hey, I'm Julia. I flew in from Perth today and it's been really good. It's worth it. Um, I was... This is a question for the whole team. I was wondering what the catalyst was in your lives that put you on the path of where you are now. Like, was it a startup you worked on? Did you just try really hard at uni? Did you have to bend over backwards to someone? <laughs> Seriously, what was the last yeah. bit? We just, we didn't hear it. Uh, <laughs> I said, did you have to bend over backwards for someone? <laughs> um, the thing that put me on the path um, was actually a very long time ago, I was a teenager, and um, I know I look like a teenager now, but um, I was actually a teenager about 20 years ago. Um, and yeah, uh, had bands that I was in as a kid. And I wanted to make websites for those bands. And so music got me into doing what I do today, essentially, because I made websites for friends' bands and my own band. Uh, I think I kind of covered it today, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, I think two, there were two kind of little key things. Um, one was moving to Paris and being bored. I was an illegal immigrant, and so I couldn't work. And so I started reading W3C specifications <laughs> uh, <laughs> to pass the time, and that helped. And the other was that I was dating a guy who said he couldn't sleep at night if my website didn't validate. I was like, <laughs> shit, I better figure out what validate means. <laughs> Uh, it's, two, it's two separate events. I got into coding uh, when I was about 12. Um, I just really liked making things. So when I got a computer of my own, after a lot of convincing towards my parents, please get me a computer, please get me a computer. So eventually they did. And I realized that I could make stuff that's actually useful for people. Because until then I used like paper and scissors and stuff to make things that weren't particularly useful. So. Coding seemed so much more creative. So I got a book about Visual C++ and I didn't understand a thing. So then I got a book about Visual Basic 6 and that was easier to understand. So I started with Visual Basic 6 and I was coding only with Visual Basic 6 for the, like the next seven years. And then we made a forum with a friend of mine. So I started wanting to tweak things. So back then uh, it was the bulletin. Back then it didn't have a plugin system. So I, I looked up, uh, basically it's plugins where find this piece in the code and change it. So I did that and I started noticing that PHP sort of made sense as a language. I was young. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I started with PHP and then I wanted to make more interactive things. So I, learned, I tried to learn JavaScript and then I discovered how cool CSS can be because I was always into graphical things. Like even in my early years in coding, I was making like color pickers and drawing applications and stuff like that. So obviously I fell in love with CSS and we're together until today. <laughs> um, well, I've always loved visual stuff. And when it comes uh, to mathematics, 
I was really interested in it. I can't remember a time when I wasn't. Uh, my dad really loves flowers and he'd bring uh, them into my room during the winter because it was too cold for them. And um, he had to tie them up so they wouldn't you know, cover the entire space. And I used to wake up every morning and look at the wires tying them up and try to imagine geometric shapes formed by those wires. And when it comes to coding, my first experience, I didn't even know it was called that. I, I just basically got a new toy and I started playing with it. And there was this small booklet and after that it was just me and my imagination and doing visual stuff and nasty stuff because uh, I love Johnny Quest and other cartoons and my mom wanted to watch a soap opera so I basically wrote a bit of code to show no signal because uh, uh, I had... <laughs> Um, she never found out. <laughs> Did she, she speak English? No. <laughs> and I really didn't know. I didn't know what programming was until I got into university. And I got to study uh, this in university because uh, it was a hot day and I entered into the, into the first building and there was a guy recruiting students and I didn't want to walk any further because it was too hot. So. <laughs> And with CSS, it was a matter of uh, going uh, to a supermarket and um, wanting to buy something cold, but it was hot, so I thought I'd make a blog to shame them, except they fell asleep before writing anything on it. And later I started writing about Formula One on it and wanted to change shit, and I thought some... I didn't know what I was changing. I didn't know that thing was called CSS. But I thought, well, with sounds pretty self-explanatory, Hex color name sounded pretty self-explanatory. I broke it. <laughs> I had no clue what that shit was, and I broke it, and I had nobody to ask. And so I started Googling the stuff I had changed, and that was it. Um, so I think, like a lot of the other people in this panel, I got a computer. Um, my family had a computer, and... I just liked to know what was inside things and what made them work, so I kind of looked physically inside it and virtually inside it and kind of pulled it apart a bit, um, sometimes irreparably. <laughs> uh, in terms of like, I don't know, academic paths or careers, like I did terribly in school, barely even finished high school and I dropped out of university and the only reason I actually got into the career that I'm in and managed to get into was nepotism, like my dad worked in, um, <laughs> in the, you know, a workplace that had a, a good first job for me and so yeah, he like pulled some strings and got me in the door and, and it's kind of humbling to think back to that, like a lot of people like to think, oh yeah, I'm here because I'm just so smart and everyone loves me and I've just, you know, all of this stuff I've made for myself. And I, I like to think back to that and I think, well, if I hadn't had that opportunity, I probably wouldn't be where I am. So yeah, it's pretty much all been luck, actually. <laughs> um, I didn't um, know what code was until I was about 24. So I studied anthropology at university. And um, after I finished my master's, um, I was just pretty sure that I wasn't ready to do a PhD, so I thought I'd take a bit of time off, and a bit of time off turned into about two years of being unemployed. Um, and during those two years, I was... Uh, uh, basically, the only thing I really did was train at this boxing gym, and the guy who ran it uh, became a friend of mine, and one day he was like, do you want to take... do you want to do my website for me? Because um, the guy who was doing it at the time uh, was, like, moving away or something. And in my naive naivety, I agreed. And I got handed like a zip file full of PHP code. And um, I basically didn't understand anything, so I threw it away and started learning because it was too late to say, um, I can't do your website for you. Um, and yeah, that was kind of it. After about, um, I don't know, a few months of that, I realized that uh, I was working on all of this stuff or learning things without anyone telling me I had to, which was uh, probably the first time uh, in my life that I hadn't had to have like a pressure of you know, exams or something to motivate me to do stuff. And then I thought I may as well get a job doing this. And yeah, and then all this stuff happened, so that's it. Uh, I built a lot of Legos as a kid. Um, and this will tie in, I promise. Um, yeah, as a kid, we had Legos, so I built stuff. And that's inherently creative, right? I suggested it, or I 
I guess if you have kids, get them Legos. When I have kids, I'm going to get them Legos. It worked out for me. Um, they came out with a product called Lego Mindstorms. Does anybody know what that is? Cool. Yeah, so basically you could make robots and, uh, you know, come stock with some, like, I mean, at the time it was pretty janky, but you, like, have a block that says go forward four spaces and you sort of click it together and there's a UI. And I got really bored with that and I found out that people could like flash the firmware of the hardware and then write uh, C code. And I didn't know what C code was, but it looked real and complicated and that made me feel good. And I realized I'm really bad at that. This is really hard or whatever. So I guess basically the way I sort of bounced between starting there, like building cool stuff and then kind of getting into programming, some heavy programming, and then realizing I'm not very good at that, uh, I sort of fled to something I thought I would be good at, uh, which is sort of, I guess, what became design. Uh, so I kind of always went back and forth. So I worked for like an, uh, a tech agency that was all, um, uh, they just built software uh, back in like 99, so it worked out well for them with the whole bust and everything. Um, but basically I went in there and I was like, I can make some cool animated GIFs, that's cool. And they were like, yeah. Uh, so we kind of do HTML and CSS, or not at the time, I guess it was all tables. Um, so I was like, well that's cool, I'll try to do that. And um, because I'm not very good at drawing, uh, still not. Um, so I did that for a while and sort of didn't even know what CSS was um, until I think, wow, I can't believe it. this just came to me. I think it was a podcast by Dan Cederholm, or they, he was a guest, if you know who he is. And he was talking about something about uh, CSS, so I thought I should read up on that. Um, and so I got pretty good at that because I wasn't good at designing things. And I didn't go to school for design school, so, uh, or excuse me, I didn't go to school for design, so... I thought I would compensate by learning how to make other people's designs work. Um, but yeah, so on the flip side, I'm more of a designer, right? Like I said, uh, I don't know, I just grew up looking at things like ads and I could tell the, the ones that were like really crappy and the ones that looked really good, the billboards. I don't know what that is, but I don't know if you had that, but some people just can't tell. And I remember as a kid walk, like going down Bowling Green, Kentucky, which is a small town, and seeing really crappy local ads versus the, I don't know, the AT&T ads that felt cool. Uh, so I always, when I was building stuff with code, I always strove or strived, I don't know, uh, to make it good looking or what I thought was good looking. Uh, and I surrounded my people, uh, I surrounded myself with people that uh, were really good designers and made really good aesthetic like print design. Uh, and since I knew how to code, I tried to take and steal what they did and try to make it look good on the web. And basically, that's what I do every day, is steal. That's why I came here. Anyways, that's it. Right, uh, so th about 30 years ago, my dad came into my room and put a computer on my desk and said, here you go, because uh, they had a new computer at work, and this, I got his hand-me-down. And I said, what do you do with a computer? And he said, you program it. So I became a programmer at a young age, uh, I, made a web, I made a program to manage my paper route when I was a boy. Um, they had a billing system and all kinds of great stuff. Uh, fast forward, I went to Caltech to be a physics major, and instead of flunking out, I changed my major to CS. Uh, and got a degree in engineering and software, and uh, then ended up in doing web stuff, and then and I hated CSS, oh my God, it's such a pile of shit. Um, <laughs> and I used to interview everybody and I'd be like, what are three things you would change about CSS if you could just change CSS? And they, people would be like, what? No, you just write CSS, it's fine. And I, you don't get the job, go away. Um, <laughs> because you're not thinking about your tools, you're not thinking that these are things that are possibly mutable. Uh, and then one day I touched a thing that changed CSS, and I said, ooh, I want to make that. Uh, so I started playing with it and really loving it. One day, I, uh, a, a contractor that had been working with us said, hey, I'm, I'm doing this consulting gig at this little consulting place called Pivotal Labs, uh, where Nicole works, and why don't you come up and just like have lunch with us and tell us what you have been doing, because I've worked with you, and I think what you're making is pretty awesome. All right, and I thought like, when I said yes, I thought like literally come and sit down and eat lunch with like six people. 
And it turns out they do these tech talk lunches and I was being invited to come and speak in front of Silicon Valley engineers. Um, and I had never gave a presentation in my life and I was shitting myself. Uh, and that video is still online. You can watch me being really bad at talking to people. Um, but I, I really thought I was onto something and I just kept at it. And did they? Did, did Simon go? <laughs> why, are you why, are you, why are you sitting here today? Um, well, how I got into the feel is more like, so I was doing music as a hobby and then uh, I did a website to just upload my music so people can listen to it. And then I figured, okay, I like the visual more than the music, so I <laughs> went into like doing websites. And I actually got sucked into the dark part, being Flash. <laughs> but uh, you too? Um, <laughs> no, but uh, uh, it's, it's good because I really liked it because it had animation, it had all those stuff. And, but now, yeah, CSS kind of caught up and I, now I'm doing CSS, yeah. Okay. Sorry? Your story time? No, we're not talking that. That was the opening, yeah, absolutely. Um, everyone, please thank our speakers.